Good morning and welcome to day 20 of our 21 days of prayer. I decided I would bring you a little bit of a story from my life a number of years ago. I got a little bit hooked on LaCroix. Now, it's an interesting story because when Charlie was younger, he did a science experiment and for his science fair project for this science experiment, uh, what he decided to do was to test if there were any methods to take a shaken can of soda and fix it so that the soda can wouldn't explode when you opened it. And he tried different methods. One was to shake it up and then wait. One was to shake it up and then open it immediately. One was to shake it up and then tap on the surface of the can for uh, 30 seconds or so before opening it. And another one was tapping on the side. There's just one problem with that. When we did the original experiment, he chose the soda from the store. We just went to the store and we said, okay, Charlie, pick up the soda that you want to use. And, and he picked up a can of soda, a number, you know, we, they were all the same kind of soda, but he picked up a can of soda called LaCroix. And this was way before the thing got popular, way before the fad, way before everybody was into, you know, sparkling water and whatnot. And it just so happened that since LaCroix has no sugar in it at all, the whole experiment failed completely because it didn't spurt the way normal soda spurts out when you shake up the can. But anyway, that was my first experience with LaCroix. And so later on, when YouTubers and podcasters and other people got really super into LaCroix and it began to be this fad, I decided to jump into it too because I had a fond memory of LaCroix from back in the days of Charlie's Science Fair. Anyway, everybody seemed to love it. I tried it. I loved it too. Well, I I mean, I fell for it the way you fall for any fad. It's the thing that seems like it's going to solve the world's problems. I, I can drink this bubbly drink without having to worry about any calories or artificial sweeteners or anything. Yeah, everybody loved it. I loved it. I fell for it. I bought it. I drank it. But I had a problem with it. It was way too much money. And I'm kind of a cheapskate. Now, don't get me wrong. I liked it. Uh, but my thirst wasn't enough to justify me going out to the grocery store and spending good money on bubbly water. Because when I'm thirsty, I already have filtered water on tap at my house. And I learned something. The thing that actually satisfies me is the thing that reveals my real thirst. See, I never had a thirst for sparkling water. I didn't need sparkling water in my life. Sparkling water wasn't the thing to solve all of my problems. I just need water. Normal, everyday, ordinary water. I like it to be filtered and I'm willing to spend money on filtered water. I like it to taste good and so I'm willing to go through the reverse osmosis process. You know, all that kind of stuff that you get when you spend money to get one of those under sink filter kind of deals. And that's important to me. My real thirst is for water that is good. <laughs> But water that is bubbly and costs a ton of money? No, that's not where my thirst lies. Not too long ago, I shared with you Psalm 63. And Psalm 63, I think, shows us thirst the way it should be. I'll read it for you again. David writes while he's in the middle of a wilderness in Judah, in the desert in Judah, says this, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands, he says. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night, because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. 
All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. I don't have a lot of time to unpack this passage for you today. I just want to highlight for you some things that I've observed in it. First of all, the number one thing that David describes in this psalm is a desperate longing, a desperate desire, a thirst for God. He says it in verse 1, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. He thirsts for God, and what's interesting is that David has a thirst for God that not many people share. I mean, a lot of us share thirsts, longings. Uh, a lot of us can feel desperate. But here's the truth. You never thirst for something that you've never tasted. You never long for something that you've never yet experienced. You can imagine. You can imagine what an experience is like, or people can tell you what an experience is like, and then because of their testimony to you, you kind of want that experience and you sort of long for it, but you can't really thirst for something or long for something unless you know what you're missing. And David indicates that in the psalm also. In verse 2 and following, he, he shares that he has had that experience with God. He says, verse 2, I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. He says, I've seen you, God. I don't know what kind of experience David had with God. We, knew that the we know that the tabernacle was around when David was around, and the temple had not yet been built, but the tabernacle was there, and God's glory was somehow present with the tabernacle. And, and David says, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've beheld your power and glory. I don't know how David had such an experience of God. We just know that he's had it. Somehow he's experienced the presence of of God. And he and he's experienced that God's love is better than life. How does he know that? Is it just because someone once told him? Or has he somehow experienced God's love? According what David according to what David says, he's experienced God's love and experienced God's power and experienced God's glory. You know, if you don't have desperate longing for God, it might be that your experience of God or your knowledge of God is lacking. David had experienced God and he knew God on some level that caused him to long for God's presence even more. If you've ever had that moment in worship where you're just sort of, sort of suddenly aware of God's presence, if you've ever been listening to a sermon being preached or some Bible passage being taught and the light bulb went off in your heart and in your mind and you said, oh my goodness, God is speaking to me right now. If that's ever happened to you, then you have a little glimpse of those moments when God's glory, his power has been revealed to you. If you've never experienced it, then your longing for it is going to be lacking. But David in this psalm mentions three things that he personally is going to do. And I think the three commitments he makes in the psalm can also help us develop our experience of God and our longing for God. David says three things. Number one, he's going to make a commitment to praise God. He says it throughout the psalm. I'm going to praise you with my lips. I'm going to sing to you. He says, I'm going to raise my hands to you. David says he is going to praise God. He's going to take opportunities to put God verbally first in his life, to say things about God that are amazing and true, to sing to God in, in, a, in a way that is personal and authentic, to lift his hands so that his physical body is in the motions as well. He is going to praise God and acknowledge that God is above all other things. Secondly, he says, I'm going to remember you, God. Through the watches of the night, I'm going to remember you. In other words, David is going to say, when my mind is not stressed out with the things I am immediately doing, my mind is going to revert back to God all the time. Thinking about God is going to be my default mental position. All other mental positions are going to be the things that show up when they need to be dealt with. But 
when I'm lying down on my bed and the things of the day are done and I've got nothing else to think about, nothing else to worry about, I could choose to worry about those things. I could choose to wrestle through those other things. But no, the default mental position I pick is remembering God. I'm going to think truths about God. I'm going to think thoughts about God. For David, I imagine he had songs memorized that he could sing. For David, I imagine that he had Bible passages memorized. In Psalm 119, we got this long soliloquy of how important it is to have the Word of God in our hearts and, and lived out through our lives. David would say repeatedly time and time again that God's Word is the light for him. And, and so remembering God and remembering God's words would be tightly linked, I'm certain. For David, even though he didn't have a full Bible like we have, he certainly had some of God's words written down that he had memorized. I'm sure of it. But his third commitment is to cling to God. Praise God is an act is an action. It's a it's a thing that I do. Remember God is a mental discipline. It's a it's a way I shape my mind. But cling to God is nothing other than just pure, abject humility. God, there's nothing left but you. Cling is kind of emotional because I'm no longer attached to myself. I'm attached to God. Cling is kind of faithful. I'm hoping that God comes through. Cling is mostly just trust. And whether you think of trust as an emotion or an action or a mental discipline, clinging says there is nothing else worth holding on to. All other things can disappear. All other things can dissipate. All other things I don't care about. I cling to God. David has these three disciplines, and if we do these same three disciplines, I'm certain it's going to increase our experience of God, and it will increase our longing for God. But David also, in this psalm, affirms three hopes. He says, number one, I will be satisfied with God. Number two, he says, God will uphold me with his right hand. And number three, he says, God will silence the liars. Now, I'm, I'm sure that David in that last phrase meant all of his enemies, all of those people who would oppose him. But it's just fascinating to me that what he says is God is going to silence the liars. He's going to silence all the people who say false things. He's going to silence all the people who uphold false things. And some of those false things are against David. Some of those false things are against God. Some of those false things are just false. But David says God is going to take care of that. So he's not worried so much about him needing to defeat all the falsehoods in the world. He's trusting God to defeat the falsehoods, to silence the liars. But he's holding on to these three things as his hope. He says, I will be satisfied. God, I long for you, and I hope I will find satisfaction in you. He says, God, I cling to you, and he hopes that God will actually uphold him. And he says, God, I remember you. And he hopes that God will silence all of the falsehood around him. Listen, for you and for me, I think this is a season in our lives that we desperately need these things. We desperately need to reignite our sense of desperation for God. We desperately need to do the things that lead to a stronger sense of God's presence and a stronger sense of of our desperation for him. And we need to simply hope and leave some things up to God. Things like, I, yes, will be satisfied. Things like, God, yes, will uphold me. And things like, God, yes, will silence the liars. For you today, as we finish up our 21 days, this is day 20, we've got just tomorrow left. And for you in this moment and for the rest of this year, I highly hope that you cultivate a longing for God, and that in the process you experience His presence, and all along the way you get better and better at keeping the commitments, and you get more and more hopeful at God's future victories.
Let me pray for you. God, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to trust you. I want to thank you for giving us the challenge to trust you. And so, Father, I pray that all of us would trust, would experience your presence, and would have a deep, desperate longing for you above all other things this day, this year, and for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.